morning, church. It is good to worship with you today. Good to be here and uh, to share this Sunday with you. A uh, couple of things to announce before we actually begin our worship service today. Um, first of all, following our service, a meal in the basement. Uh, and there, I was down there checking, uh, as you know, I'm very hungry. Uh, I was down there uh, checking on that, and there is plenty of food, so even if you didn't bring anything, please join us. Um, there, is, there is a ton to eat down there, and uh, so we would encourage you to do that. We always enjoy that time of fellowship. Uh, our session meets tomorrow evening. If there is something that uh, is on your mind, uh, see one of our elders uh, so that they can uh, bring that up in the meeting. And uh, there's something of concern to you. Uh, we will address that at our time together. You'll notice that all of the Christmas things begin today. And um, <clears throat> you can see those listed in your bulletin. The shoe boxes are over there. They're ready to go, uh, be taken out and filled and brought back. And uh, Christmas cheer uh, uh, begins today. So all your uh, food items that you would normally bring, they go in that barrel in the back and that will go to Operation Christmas Cheer. And um, the Salvation Army, we are ringing bells at Chiefs. All right, at the Chief Supermarket, it is on Wednesday, so it is a it is a day through the week. Uh, Deb has the sheet over there. There's two ringers per slot. I think there are two-hour shifts there. I think we're taking both doors maybe this year. I, I'm not sure how that's set up, but uh, it is over there if you would like to uh, help them. That's something we have done annually since I've been here, and uh, <clears throat> we would encourage you if you have the time to be a part of that. Uh, you'll notice in your uh, bulletin the uh, flyer for the Jazz Vesper service. That is uh, something we are really looking forward to. Uh, the theme of that will be transitions and uh, it will be a time devoted just to reflecting on the various transitions in life, how we prepare for them and how we uh, can handle those uh, and just uh, kind of maybe look back and see the hand of God as God has brought us through those times. So that is November 10th and um, we are looking forward to that. We are hosting the Thanksgiving service this year for the community. Uh, I talked to Pastor uh, Eric McLeod this week. We had lunch together, finally got to meet him, who is across the street. He is an interim. Uh, he will be there six months to a year to help them, and uh, he will be participating. Father Doug from the Catholic Church uh, will be with us. The uh, Emmanuel is bringing their bell choir. And so the bell choir will be here. There will also be a uh, vocal choir. So if you are interested in being a part of the vocal choir, we have the music in the office. We can run off copies of that for you where you can uh, look at that. We would encourage you uh, to be a part of that if you would like to sing. So those are things that are going on. Those are things that are happening uh, uh, for us and around us and uh, with us. And so we encourage you. This is a time of year where we kind of get over the summer whatever that is and we get our sleeves rolled up and we get back to work and so I encourage you to uh, see opportunities and take advantage of that is there anything else that needs to be announced today Tom? yes I'm giving a minute for mission. yeah uh, to say a little bit more about uh, the shoe boxes Operation Christmas Child is starting today. It concludes on November 17th, five weeks from now. So uh, please do not come on November 17th trying to figure out what day and time the boxes are actually going to be picked up as certain members of my family used to. Uh, there are a couple things that you should know. Um, they do not want you to send toothpaste or lotions or anything in a bottle this year, probably for the same reason we don't do them in airlines. Please don't send any candy or food because it won't, would not survive the trip. But there's a very long list of suggestions in very, very small type that will get posted someplace. You can also probably find it online. If you look in your bulletins, there's a website you can go to. At that website, you can choose to pay the $9 donation online to send the boxes and have something printed out to put on the boxes. If you do that, you even have an opportunity to see where your box goes. 
So that might be an option for you. There's also an option online to buy a box online. So if you don't have the time to do the shopping, uh, you can do that as well to contribute. Uh, whatever options are for you, there'll be more about this as it comes. What you need to know is the boxes are available and they are due on November 17th. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Anything else? All right, let's begin our worship service. Would you take a moment to quiet your hearts and prepare yourself for the worship of God? Maybe a silent prayer or just, just some silence. Separating the world that was before you walked in, the world that will be when you walk out of this place, that we might just experience the world as it is while we are here. Join me, if you would, in our call to worship. The glorious God of all creation and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ summons us to worship together this day. We come to be your people, O God. We come to be your people, O God. We come to be your people, O oh God. We come to be your people, O oh God. We come to be your people, O oh God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Good morning. morning. Please join me in the calling of the Psalms. Today we join generations of faithful believers in offering ourselves to God through the words of the psalmist. Today's reading is Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You search out my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all of my ways. For you form my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. The scriptures inform us that our trespasses were nailed to the cross when our Lord was crucified. The full payment for our sin was offered in the death of Jesus. When Jesus was raised from the dead, God gave evidence to all that sin's power over us has been broken and new eternal life has conquered death. Let us confess our sin in light of the cross and resurrection of Jesus, our risen King. God of love, in the wrong we have done, and in the good we have not done. We have sinned in ignorance. We have sinned in weakness. We have sinned through our own deliberate fault. We long for the day when our world will be a dwelling place for your love. Yet we confess that we are often anxious. We do not trust each other. We harbor bitterness and resentment, and we hold grudges. We are not willing to take the risks and make the sacrifices that love requires. Look upon us with kindness and grace and show us how to walk in your paths. In your mercy, forgive us, Lord. Look now upon us with loving kindness and compassion and incline your ear to our prayers. Hear us when we cry out to you. Forgive us and renew our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's now take a moment of silent prayer, reflection, and confession. Amen. The Lord's words are full of faithfulness, and the Lord's deeds are filled with grace. The Lord upholds all who are failing and raises up all who are bowed down. Through Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, we are forgiven. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Let's now take a moment to share the peace with those around us.
Well, there are several people who are visiting with us today. We uh, welcome you. Um, some of you are regular visitors, uh, but making her debut, uh, I believe, is Chloe, right? Is this her first Sunday? No. No? Okay. I feel so bad it wasn't here. <laughs> <laughs> so Julie, did you get a chance to check her out? Okay. <laughs> Would you bow your heads with me and let us pray? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the scriptures that we read today. Thank you for the pictures that are painted through them. We thank you for the images that we receive. We thank you for the, 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 the ideas that are spoken, not just to our minds, but deep into our hearts. We thank you for all of that. We would ask this morning simply this, that you'd give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to understand those things that you have for us from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Our reading today comes to us from Jeremiah chapter 18. And the word of the Lord reads this way. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand. And he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good for the potter to do. And then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time, I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. And if that nation or kingdom that I, uh, any time I declare, and, and if that nation, um, which of, of which I have spoken, excuse me, turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it, and if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I intended to do to it. Now therefore, say to the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, behold, I am shaping disaster against you and devising a plan against you. So return everyone from his evil way and amend your ways and your deeds. This is the word of the Lord. Well, last week uh, we looked at Jeremiah and we had the picture of leaking cisterns. Uh, I heard from several people afterwards some of the imagery that came to them as we spoke that term. I don't want to go into that, um, what those things are. But it was a very graphic picture of cisterns that had been hewed out to hold water for life and those cisterns and leaking. And today, Jeremiah's lesson takes us to the hand or to the room where a potter is busy at work. You might say we go from leaking cisterns to cracked pots somewhere, something like that, I think would be kind of an appropriate setting. You know, Jeremiah is like all people. Jeremiah has a normal world in which he lives in. We don't know what that world might look like as a prophet. Who, who, I mean, who could imagine what Jeremiah's day was normally like? But it was a normal world. He probably had his routine, much like you and I do. You know, you get up in the morning, you have your routine, you make your coffee, you drink it, then after that you become a living human being and you are fit to talk with people and begin to think good, nice thoughts, etc. And then you go through your day. Everybody has that. Whatever that routine is, Jeremiah had that routine. But God calls Jeremiah out of that routine. He says, Jeremiah, today you and I, we're going to make a visit. 
and we're going to go to the house of a potter because I want you to visibly experience I want you to see with your eyes what I want to say now the potter's house is an interesting thing because in the day and time in which Jeremiah lived potters had a very important role to play in the culture everything that you had from the plates that you uh, ate your meals on from the pots that you cooked in from the jugs that you had your beverages in all of those things were molded and shaped by the potter and then they were put out in the marketplace and they were bought so in a way the, the potter was essential to the ongoing well-being of the culture but the potter is very similar in our day and time to other things. I want you to think for a minute. How many of you ever been to where you watch somebody who is a glass, a glass blower? They take and they, they take the raw things and you know they, they dip it in the silicone that has been fired, it's on the end of a thing, and they blow into it and they begin to create and they roll it and they have tools that they shape it. What you observe through that is that there's something in the image of the glass blower that he wants to create or she wants to create. There is something that is going on in the process. There's, a, there's something in the heart or something in the mind of this artist who takes then the raw materials and forms and shapes it into what they desire it to be. And so there's a process of just the right amount of heat and just the right amount of tools and just the right amount excuse me, a blowing into the, into the thing and the glass is formed. Perhaps you've seen an artist at work, an artist who doesn't have colors but who makes the colors from basic colors and you see their palette and they take a little bit of this color, a little bit of that and they take a little bit of this and they put it all together and they, they get it just right to make color that's going to go onto a canvas is going to represent something. Something that was in the mind or in the heart of that painter is fashioned on a, on a palette and then applied to a canvas. And when it's all done, you see the image of what was in here. One of the experiences I had at the church that I was at before I came here was that every year uh, during one of the special, I think it was the Easter service, while special music was going on, there would be an artist on the stage and the artist would take a blank, black, normally a black canvas, and in the three or four minutes that the song was taking place, would create something. Might start with just a dot, and then things would be added, and you say, what in the world is going on? And then when it was all finished, there was this image that you would look at and you say, my goodness, how'd they ever get there? But something that was in the mind or in the heart of that artist came to life as colors were blended and the canvas was decorated with the various colors. Maybe you've seen a weaver at work who takes and spins their yarn in various colors and then weaves it through the loom and creates a tapestry. Perhaps maybe you've seen a woodworker who used to do this in my father's shop. We had a lathe and we could create all kinds of things. Maybe you'd create a bowl out of a piece of gnarled wood that was from a, a tree. You ever see those, those, uh, those uh, uh, gnarly areas on a tree? Those are cut out and the grain is amazing and, and that is fastened to a lathe. And then as the lathe spins, you take various tools and you create something that you think of in your mind. Or maybe you've experienced somebody who is very talented, a songwriter, who sits at a keyboard or at a guitar and plays different chords and gets a different idea of how that, those chords progress, how those chords can be combined to create a tune and then adds words to them and something that was in here or here gets put out into the form of music. One of the things that amazes me about music is it seems like no matter how many millions of songs have been written, there's always new lines, new, new patterns of notes and chords and rhythms that create something new. It's like there's no end to what can be created. If we were to visit any of those, we would kind of see what Jeremiah saw with the potter. 
God takes him to the potter's house so that he can visually experience this potter at work. In each of the cases I talked about, there's a direct link between someone acting upon something else in order to create something. And whatever it is that's created was something that was only experienced before in the heart or in the mind of the creator. If we were observers in the process, we might look at them and say, no, you can't do it that way. What are you doing? You're messing it all up. But we would just be outside observers looking at the process with it only partially complete and making judgments on just the very little that we would know. We would have to trust that the artist, the potter, the weaver, the songwriter, the glass blower, knows in fact what they are doing and what they are trying to create. Jeremiah observes this potter and he's working over his wheel and he's got his foot going and the wheel is spinning and there's a lump of clay on there and with just the right amount of water and just the right twists of the hand as the clay is spinning on there, a form begins to take place. Too much water and the clay becomes just a sloppy mess. Not enough water and the clay won't form into what it's supposed to be. But the potter knows from experience exactly the right amount of water and the right amount of pressure with the hands. And something begins to emerge. And then all of a sudden as it emerges, something goes wrong with it. Jeremiah observes that the, the clay that's on, on the potter's wheel is flawed or spoiled. And then he watches as the potter takes that lump of clay, puts it back into a lump, and then begins to reform and reshape it until the original intention of the potter is formed on the wheel. Jeremiah sees that. I don't know how many visits he'd ever made to a potter's house, but he notes that this day. And as he's observing this lump of clay that gets spoiled and then taken over and then reformed into another lump and then eventually is made into what the potter wants, God speaks to him. God speaks amid the visual demonstration. And God asks the question, don't I have the same rights as the potter? Don't I have the same privilege as the glass blower, as the artist with the canvas, as the weaver with the loom, or the woodworker with the lathe? Don't I have the same? writes as you would as the songwriter. God says, I am the potter and I have the right to do with you what the potter has done to this clay. You are the clay that is in my hands. There's something about that that we find as human beings troubling. We are very reluctant to give God ultimate power in the shaping and molding of our lives. But if you think about it, God is creator. You exist because God designed you. God made you. We push back on that. We push back on the fact that God is somehow responsible with a plan that we are somehow a part of. We, we always kind of ridicule that, say, are we just robots then? If God is this potter, what choices do we really have? But the fact remains, God says, I am the potter, and you are the clay. We understand that principle is sovereignty. God has the right to make from the clay what he desires, what's in his heart, what's in his mind. God has the right to paint on the canvas his colors into his design. God has the right of the glass blower to breathe into the tube and to take the, the, the tools and to form the glass the way he wants it. God has the right to weave together the yarn and make the tapestry 
that he chooses. God is the potter. People are the clay. And God has the right to make from the clay what he desires, what he sees. Now, the, the interesting thing about all that, if you think of God as some sort of masochistic or God as some sort of person or, or being that, that intends uh, to, to watch people, you know, uh, in, 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 a, in a negative light, then you could be concerned about that. But God's plans and purposes are always for our good, always for a life that is beyond blessing, a life that is abundant. And so God is this person who is at the potter's wheel and molding and shaping the clay. If you recall the story in Genesis of our creation, God is the one who is designing all of the creation. He is the landscaper. He creates all of the various life forms and the animals and it is all good. And then God reaches down into the earth and he grabs the clay and he molds it and he shapes it into an image and it's just like him. And he calls it human being. And then he takes that piece of clay and he breathes into it the breath of life. And it comes alive. We have no say in that. God is the one who designed us. God says in Isaiah, Woe to him who strives with him who formed him, a pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, What are you making? And why are you making it this way? We either take comfort from that or we resist that our whole lives. We're bitter, we're angry. We're somehow, this idea where that, you know, we were somehow created wrongly. I was, I was grousing a little bit with my pastor friends this Thursday when we were together for breakfast. I said I was either born 25 years too late or I was born 25 too, years too early. I haven't figured it out yet. 25 years ago, if I were born 25 years ago, then all of the things that I understand that are true and from my world that was molded and shaped, I could just flow with. Or if I was born 25 years later, the world that is now taking shape and being formed and the culture that is now prevailing, I'd be more comfortable with. Right now, I just feel like I'm somebody on the outside looking in. You ever feel that way? And one of my pastor friends said, so God made a mistake of when you were born. And I said, he absolutely did. Absolutely. You ever feel that way? God said, you have no right to do that. I'm the potter and you're the clay. But here's the interesting thing. Here's the little twist to that. We all understand the idea of God's sovereignty and God rules and reigns over all things and the plans and purposes of God prevail. But Jeremiah exposes something else. Jeremiah says God is involved in an ongoing molding, an ongoing shaping. An ongoing plan that is unfurling. He's still painting at the easel. He's still blowing into the glass rod. He's still spinning the wood on the lathe. He's still spinning yarn and weaving it on the loom. He's still writing the song. He's still at work in all of those things, Jeremiah says. He's involved in an ongoing molding and a shaping plan that doesn't stop with creation. It's an ongoing process that Jeremiah introduces. This is a present tense, a future tense. Can I not do what the potter has done? God doesn't say, isn't it right that I've done what the potter did? Don't I have the right to continue to work with the clay and to mold the clay? 
And then Jeremiah introduces the idea that it's not just about us as individuals, but it's about people group, kingdoms and nations. God says, you know what? If I look at a, if I look at a kingdom or I look at a nation, and, and I look at them in their evil ways and I say, that's not going to prevail and I'm going to bring judgment on that nation. This is the potter, I had that right. But if that nation repents of their evil, I'll change my mind. And if I design a nation and that nation begins to, to and that I design that nation for blessing like you, Israel, and you begin to do evil, I'll change my mind. Jeremiah introduces something to us that just, it's kind of like the, the thing that just makes the artist stop. It makes the potter stop. The clay, as it's being formed, all of a sudden there's a flaw in it. So the potter, what does the potter do? He doesn't take and throw the clay out. He takes the clay and he remolds it until it conforms to what he wants. God is involved in his sovereignty with an ongoing, dynamic, unfolding plan for life. Not only with us, but as with nations and kingdoms. What Jeremiah is suggesting to us is that God's sovereignty and God's molding as the potter is affected by how the clay responds to the potter's hands. Now all of a sudden it becomes difficult. People that are just fatalists who just say, well, it's all in God's plan and God's just going to do what God's going to do and we really don't have any role in it. <clears throat> Jeremiah says, I got something to tell you. You do have a role in it. This is a collaborative effort between the sovereign God and people. That God takes and changes his mind, and that bothers us. <clears throat> well, how much does God change his mind? Well, we don't really know. Nobody can figure that out. God's sovereignty is unfolding in a dynamic, fluid, responsive way. God wants us to understand that, and he wants Israel to understand that. He wants Judah, he says, because I'm telling you, Judah, I right now am shaping disaster against you, and I'm devising a plan against you. So I would recommend you return from your evil ways and amend your ways and your actions. Why? So I can change my mind. Jeremiah presents a concept to us that we as human beings can't really understand. It is this whole idea between God's sovereignty and human free will. It's been at the core of theological debate forever. And we tend to either side one way or the other with it. We have a hard time holding those things in balance. And I'm not here to explain all of that to you this morning. No one can. I'm just here to tell you that God is sovereign and the plans and purposes of God always come to pass. But God is always fluid and God is always dynamic and God is always willing to work with us. And when the clay is flawed, God doesn't just throw it on the scrap heap. God takes that and he remolds it and he reshapes it. Aren't you glad? There's been so many times that God has been working and molding my life and all of a sudden the flaws in my life, the, the cracks that begin to emerge within the clay as it's being molded, the things, I just flat, flat out resist what God is doing. God doesn't just throw me on the scrap heap. God says, okay takes me off the wheel, puts me in a big lump, then puts me back on the wheel and starts spinning it again. Again, and again, and again. So here's a couple things I want you to know this morning from our text. Some things that Jeremiah presents to us that are just amazing things. First of all, God's plans and purposes are essential in the shaping of the clay. 
Listen, we are not left to ourselves to devise our own ways. We don't have to do this alone. We are not some creature out here in an endless universe. <clears throat> some speck of dust that just has to try to figure everything out. No, there is a divine plan. There is a divine purpose behind what we are. We don't know what that looks like. But we know that God is behind the scenes guiding us. And we know that when we hit a, 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 a brick wall, or we hit a slippery slope, or we hit some place where we just have given up or given in, we can trust that God is going to take us and take that, that lump of clay and reshape it and remold it and work it within the plans that God has for us. I think Jeremiah also wants us to know that God's sovereignty, God's overall purposes, they never change, regardless of what humans do. It's especially true when we think about God's character. God is unchangeable. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's plans and purposes never fail in this sense. That God is always faithful. God is always dependable. And God is always trustworthy. Jeremiah wants us to know that we need that in the most difficult times of our life. God is at work. Regardless of how bleak it is, regardless of how much the suffering is involved, but regardless of how difficult things become, we have this certainty that God is at work and God is faithful and God never fails to be God, ever. But I warn you, God is not predictable. You know that, don't you? Just when you think you have God all figured out, and just when you think that you know the way life is supposed to be, and then all of a sudden a curveball comes along, God is not predictable. I think Jeremiah wants us to know that God's plans and purposes are always fluid, and that we are somehow involved in the process. But it's impossible to presume the outcome of it. How you cooperate with God, how you respond to God, how you listen, how you learn, how you walk, those things are important in the overall shaping and plans and purposes of God. Yes, God is sovereign, but you have a role to play in it. Perhaps the thing I'm most grateful about with Jeremiah is that when God's plans are frustrated or resisted, we are not discarded. All of us are cracked. All of us are blemished. All of us are far more frail or weak than we can ever imagine. And God doesn't look at that and get frustrated and say, okay, you're out of here. God puts us back on the wheel. He mixes a little more color to the tent of the paint. He gets a different tool out on the lathe. He begins playing different chords and say, okay, this will work. It's one thing to imagine that God having done something. It's another thing to imagine God being with us and everything being dynamic and fluid and unfolding in real time as we live. And I want to leave you with this because I think Jeremiah would want us to know that God always issues invitations that allow him to change his plans. God desires his plans of unfolding goodness and pur his purposes 
to be present in our life and he's patient and long suffering to bring it about. God always extends to us the opportunity to change. Always extends to us the, the, the chance to say, okay, Lord, I'm willing to give this to you. Okay, Lord, I'm willing to set this aside. Okay, God, I'm ready to forgive that person. I can no longer harbor that bitterness. Okay, God, I choose to obey. God continues to hold that out. He is patient and long-suffering. And where sin abounds, his grace abounds even more. Jeremiah watched a potter work a lump of clay and in the process discovered that God is just like the potter at work in our lives, both individually and as nations, to bring about his plans and his purposes. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words of Scripture. Seal them now into our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
you join me in our profession of faith? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. This morning as we receive our offering, we have the special treat of having Michael Gallagher uh, share with us on the saxophone. Would you join me in our offering prayer? Merciful God, with joy and thanksgiving, we offer what you have first given us, our talents, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive what we offer for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A couple of prayer requests today. Um, First of all, uh, April Brown is having a uh, hip replacement surgery tomorrow, okay? So we want to keep her in our prayers. And then a prayer of thanksgiving, um, Pat Sh uh, Schrader uh, was discharging home. That's who Jack is with, right? He's involved with, that's a sister-in-law. Sister-in-law is home. And she's home, and so that means Jack may be coming home? Either tonight or tomorrow night. Yeah. Okay, that'd be cool. Uh, we miss him, um, and so we are grateful for that. Let us go before our God, and let us pray for those who are around us and with us, those who are, we are mindful of in family and friends and neighbors who have needs. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come to you. We thank you for your goodness and blessings. We thank you for the good report of, of Pat Sh uh, Schrader. Um, who has now come home from the hospital. We thank you for the opportunity we have to lift before you those who are important, 
those who are dear to us, those who are, are part of our lives, those who we know who are struggling. Your word commands us to pray for leaders, for all who are in positions of authority. You command us to do that, that we might live peaceable lives. So we ask you, Lord, to take those who are in, responsible for leading and guiding nations, those who are responsible for administering justice, those who are responsible for enacting laws, those who are responsible for decisions that are made regarding the people who depend upon them. We pray for them. Give them your wisdom. Root out among them those who are evil and those who are wicked and set people who are righteous and people who have the fear of God into places and positions of power and authority. That all people, all people might be blessed under their leadership. We pray for those in our communities who lead and who guide us, who govern us, who serve us. Those particularly who are first responders, who are there when we most desperately need help those who put their lives in danger for us, we pray for them. Pray for our teachers and our principals, administration in our schools, as they have the task of molding and shaping young lives. We pray for them. And now, Father, we pray for those who are close to us, those who are struggling, those who are sick, those who are facing surgeries, those who are facing, Father, dire circumstances, those who are just involved in just tough, brutal, hard situations. Lord, we take their names now and we place them within the palms of our hands. Those that we hold dear, whose names we placed in our hands, we now lift before your throne. We release them into your care. We ask, Lord, that you would be with them, that you would watch over them, that you would bring healing to them, that you would preside in their lives with love and grace, help them to know that they are not alone, that you would enter into the corridors of darkness and discouragement and depression, and that you would bring hope that you, Father, would be Father God to them and minister to them. Especially we pray for April as she undergoes this surgery. Pray for wisdom and skill among those who will be ministering in the surgery to her. Lord, all of these things we gratefully and humbly place within your care, knowing that you care for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
face you, let me pray over the food so you don't have to wait for me to get down there. So you can just, but leave something for me because I'm hungry, all right? <laughs> so let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together in worship. And now as we join together in fellowship and in eating and sharing table with one another, we offer our thanks to you. Nourish us with our fellowship. Nourish us with this food. Nourish us with your spirit. And may our time together be special. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, may the Lord our God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Be at peace with the fact that the potter has you in his hands and his plans and designs and purposes for your life are for good and are for his pleasure. Go in peace, for we are. Amen.